Uh, good evening, everyone. So it's my first jog in Singapore, although I wanted to to join uh, a while ago. But thanks to Michael, he actually convinced me, and uh, and it's a good thing because uh, um, at Red Hat we have actually uh, um, a presence in Singapore since 2000. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but before I arrived in Singapore in 2008, um, and I'm here almost 10 years. So. Um, I've done some events, but mostly uh, events driven by Red Hat. But I think as a, an engineer at Red Hat, I think I'm very, very happy to, to be able to share our experience, and especially on the open source side. So I think, uh, 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 I hope you'll, you'll learn something today. So I'll talk about uh, a bit of the history. Uh, I mean, most of you know open source. It's true that we work from garages sometimes. <laughs> we work from Starbucks, we work from home. We have also, I mean, Red Hat is, a, is actually a, um, different from, uh, from the initial startup. Actually, uh, Red Hat is, a, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the history of Red Hat, where, how it started and when they acquired us as well, um, to give you a little bit of perspective about you know, how open source happens, you know? Okay. Uh, I'll talk about some of the projects, the Java user group. So, I'll try to focus on Java, obviously, and, but uh, with not just Java, so I'll talk a little bit you know, about the other projects. Uh, I'll talk about things also related to the, what's happening on the JVM, above the JVM, all the way up to enterprise Java and the future of Java, and also at the JDK level. Okay? But it won't be too technical, but I think uh, uh, what we, we suggested with Michael, I think in the future, if we really want to deep dive in some of those areas, in some of those uh, technologies, we can do that. And I think um, I'll, I'll, well, I'll let Michael uh, talk about you know, some of the events we have in the future, but you'll have plenty of opportunity to do that, okay? Uh, some of them actually, uh, uh, like Whitefly, Undertow, and also a little bit about the future of you know, Enterprise Java. I don't know if you, who heard about Whitefly actually? here. That's, that's good, that's good. Uh, and micro profile. Okay, so I'll touch a little bit on that, not uh, uh, just briefly towards the end, um, if you're interested. So for many of, of you, uh, JBoss is synonym to an app server. Uh, JBoss actually started with Mac Furry in 1999. Uh, the goal was to actually provide an open source uh, alternative to the proprietary uh, uh, world. Uh, the vendors like IBM and BA at the time were the, some of the first to implement some of the Java specification around Java development uh, on the Java web servers. So whether the serverless specifications, the, the EGB specifications, all that were actually proprietary, but uh, JBoss was one of the first one to deliver uh, an open source implementations. Uh, so the first release was in 99. Actually, uh, um, I was actually working at Barclays Capital at the time on the e-commerce team. And um, we used to, to already introduce some uh, extreme programming techniques with especially pair programming. So I was sitting next to one of the developers and, and I was like, oh, it doesn't, you don't seem to work on a, on a project. We were working on master data <laughs> project and it was actually working actually on an open source project. So. Uh, but for a good thing, we were actually, like many people at the time, a bit resistant to, uh, to be forced to use uh, the big app servers at the time. We were, usually it was a mandate from the, app, the application architecture team to use uh, EGB from, as a web sphere. And a lot of us were looking at alternatives. So one of my guys actually already started to join the, the JBoss team and working already on the JMX uh, microkernel. Okay, so, so that's a bit of his story. Um, uh, JBoss was acquired by Red Hat uh, in 2006, uh, just before I joined uh, Red Hat. I was a customer, I used JBoss for many years, and uh, in 2007 I joined, so it's gonna be 10 years, actually, next month. And um, I'll talk you through some of the evolution of JBoss, and it does actually follow some of the the enterprise, on one end, the, the, the enterprise Java specifications, because we are licenses to Oracle and Sun before. And also, we, we have to answer some of the, the demand from the, from the users. I'll talk about 
the community as well. And when we go a little bit in the open source model, the open source culture, how is that dynamic and what happens, how things grow and develop. Uh, so we, we've been acquired by Red Hat. So as, as I said before, so Red Hat has been founded in, in 1993, uh, got IPO'd. We got acquired in, in, 2007, in 2006. Uh, there's a lot of major milestones. I'll focus some on the, the middleware side mostly, but uh, there's actually an important shift also, uh, especially after uh, when we started to release OpenShift Enterprise, where you started to see people moving workload, not just on premise, but or virtual, virtual environment, but also on the cloud. Okay, so we, we had uh, JBoss running on uh, Amazon, as we had AMIs already for Amazon. And then we all started to work with OpenShift to actually provide our, um, our own implementation running on those environments. And that, that shift has triggered a lot of changes, and not just the TCK or the enterprise uh, or the, the various specifications, but the shift in the industry has triggered a lot of things that made us change JBoss uh, fundamentally in its core. And I'll go through that as well. Okay. Uh, so we did few other acquisitions, and one of some of <coughs> we acquired Fidenry also, the mobile backend as a service, and that was also another change in the middleware space. We talk about Java, but uh, Fidenry is actually a, a Node.js backend, so it seems a little bit different. Many people think about JBoss as a Java-only shop, but we're not actually. We do a lot more than that, and I'll, I'll touch on that later also. Uh, and for API management, we are also acquired uh, TreeScale. So when, when we acquire companies, and, uh, and I'll talk to a little bit more in details in, uh, later, sometimes these are, they may be proprietary companies. And we go through a process of open sourcing them, okay? Uh, so let's talk uh, about the open source model. Uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, you talk about, uh, 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 so that's, the garage, the people, you know, <laughs> it's not just about uh, uh, developers. So initially, uh, actually, uh, let me step back a little bit. So you, you see one million projects here. And when I say we open source some of the, the, the software, uh, here some of the, these are from Black Duck, Black Duck and Northbridge. So the, in 2015 future open source survey, we, we have to also, what, what we provide is uh, uh, IP identifications to the people who actually subscribe to, to our stuff, okay? And that's how we do it. When, when we go through, let's say we do an acquisition, when we go through the open source process, we have to make sure that the source we deliver is actually compliant, you know, from an IP perspective, okay? So, and as part of that process, we of course go through all the code and uh, if you look at, just take JBoss, the application server, just in itself, we have hundreds of sub-projects in it, okay? And I'm talking just direct dependencies. They can be also intransitive dependencies that brings others. And similarly for Node.js, you know, uh, it's even a bigger ecosystem, okay? So I think, uh, so that's represent the, the open source world. The open source world is actually a, a very, very large. Uh, but Red Hat doesn't code all of that, obviously. <laughs> uh, there will be a lot. Um, uh, but what we do and what we're very good at is actually bringing the first class uh, components together into something that's stable, that is standard, and that's something that is supportable. Because what matters to the enterprise, to users, is actually something that they can uh, reproduce. They want to develop and deploy exactly without changes. You know, they want to focus on the application development. They want to make sure that, uh, uh, I was talking to Michael uh, uh, earlier, uh, one of the biggest problems, let's say you, very more and more we hear about these, uh, these bugs, like hard bleed, for example. How do you fix an hard bleed uh, uh, vulnerability in a deployment in a, a thousand servers where you have different version of the, an app server or different open source component you've downloaded? How do you do that today? So I think that's what we answer. That's where Red Hat actually brings the, the, the knowledge into actually providing mechanism to deliver asynchronously those fixes to you, okay? So I think uh, uh, this is more than just people coding and pushing on GitHub or Subversion. Uh, there's a lot more behind it, okay, to harden, certify it. 
So we, we work also with uh, other, uh, we're part of the uh, expert group, for example, for, with Oracle, IBM, and others for Java E. And, and the same for any other standardized as, uh, other bodies, um, uh, as a web services, and, you know, and there's a lot of them. So I think we, we work with other and micro profile uh, lately. Also, we work with IBM and others to, to collaborate and drive and use open source as the, the channel to drive standard, through standard, standardization. Uh, the shared problem has solved faster. Um, uh, I think uh, when I was a customer, actually, we had problems or needs and requirements, and we started to contribute to open source. So, uh, very often, uh, open source projects start from a need. Actually, uh, Nike re uh, recently released uh, open source something. I'm sure Red Mart will probably open source something. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so I think uh, uh, it, it's not driven by product marketing, product management. It's actually driven by real issues and, and people working together. And you see that with OpenStack, you see that with other projects, where, and Docker, same thing. So where we are, when these projects are initiated outside, we actually contribute also to them. Okay? So we're not just consuming, we are actually extremely invested into them. As a, we, we could contribute to your project by 90%, 99%, but sometimes it's just uh, 10%. In the Linux kernel, for example, we are the la one of the largest contributors. Okay. Uh, transparency, that's very important. Uh, everything we do, including in my team, engineering upstream, we do it on GitHub or openly. So we have discussion forums. There's nothing that we do in my team that you're not aware of, that you can't find. Okay. All our discussion IR, IRC are available. We do that on Freenode. Every meetings, every discussion happen openly. So I think uh, this is very important. We, we don't, there's nothing we hide. And that's a culture, it's in our DNA at Red Hat. Okay? That started at JBoss and it was, uh, it was a perfect fit. So there's nothing we, and the same thing with the macro profile. Okay? The, 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 we encourage that collaborations to drive innovation. So that's really at the heart of how we function and in the culture of, you know, I'd read that, okay? So it's, uh, it's something that's very strong, actually. <laughs> Do you wanna use a, a Mac that creates, sometimes I have comments as well. <laughs> but uh, I think it's, uh, this is normal, and it's actually a pleasure to, to, uh, uh, to work at, uh, in a company where we actually walk the talk, okay? Um, so typically what happened to this project, and I mentioned one of the work we do is actually take those projects and actually productize them. So make sure that they are certified. Make sure they are they run on all these operating systems without regressions. They are certified against all these JDBC drivers, against all these architecture, whether it's ARM, uh, RISC, and others. So that's, that's the work we do. That's the work that people don't have to do because uh, this takes a long time. And I'll go into more details later, actually, uh, in some of that. So that's, um, um, uh, that's not only at the at the runtime level, we do also contribute, for example, for uh, Patternfly is actually, uh, um, actually a project. You can actually access it, patternfly.org, I think. It's actually a set of, of uh, Angular-based or you know, a, a kind of look and feel and, and open source uh, um, uh, uh, UI component that you can actually use to actually assemble UIs. Okay? So it's, uh, and we use that for all our projects as well. Okay? So everything we do, even from the UI down to the runtime, we make it open. Okay. So now I'm switching to Java. <laughs> I'm sure that reminds, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's something, uh, a picture that uh, is common to many of you. But uh, is Java dead? No, I think that's, uh, that's something I wanted to touch on because uh, I think that came up you know, quite, quite often. Uh, and, and sometimes due to the silence of, you know, what's happening to the enterprise Java specifications, etc. But Java is here first. It was, it was actually uh, designed for IoT, for embedded devices. Uh, if, uh, if you remember the first uh, iteration of Java. Uh, now we see it a lot in microservices, you know, uh, whether it's a micro profile, Wi-Fi Swarm, Payara, uh, uh, Spring Boot, uh, ja it's Java based. All the Android ecosystem, is also Java based, okay? With new lang JVM based languages laid on top of it, like Kotlin or Ceylon. Uh, event driven reactive frameworks are based on Java also. You look at Vertex, there's one good example, okay? 
Um, and it's also adapted, adaptable to new paradigm. So I think there is a, Java is here. We actually um, invest a lot of, of uh, time and effort in, in Java. Uh, of course, there is, as I mentioned before, we also have investments in Node.js and other languages. So I think uh, Java is definitely here for. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. <laughs> um, so we have an uh, investment. As I mentioned, investment in Java, what does that mean? So our commitment is obviously as a licensee on Java E. So we, we actually, if you, who has used Java E6 here? Java E6, yeah, a little bit. OK, a lot of the specs, of the enhancements in Java E6 actually came from JBoss, OK? CDI, bin validations, et cetera, actually have been contribution from, from Red Hat, OK, Red Hat engineers. Um, on the JDK as well, we actually, uh, Jason Green wrote a blog recently on actually all the uh, the work we do with uh, Oracle and help Oracle actually uh, around Java 9 uh, with Jigsaw project. You know, all the we actually introduced modularity because we were waiting for it. Supposed to be in Java 8, uh, we introduced it already in uh, JBoss AS7 with JBoss modules because there's a lot of goodness there. We wanted to to inherit from from the OSGI world, for example, some of the notions that we wanted to introduce. So we have actually a lot of expertise, and we contribute that directly with Oracle, OK? Um, and also, in, we invested in the future uh, and working with other, other groups. And I'll touch on that later at the end of the presentation around uh, the future of Java in the enterprise, because uh, Java is here to stay. Uh, there is a lot of requirements, especially with the, with the direction we take around cloud, cloud native, uh, hybrid environments. Uh, you know, very high density uh, constraint devices. So we're working on that. Um, of course, we uh, we have uh, committers and uh, lots of contribution to OpenJDK. So Red Hat is uh, probably the, the most active there uh, on uh, Arch 64 ARM processors, uh, also on uh, uh, ultra low ultra low latency uh, garbage collections. So we have actually projects that are an extreme uh, uh, memory. Um, um, extremely large uh, heap size. So that's uh, that's definitely uh, something that in JBoss we are very interested in because the the Open GDK laid on top of the operating system is very important for us for optimization, especially for near real time application like trading applications, betting applications, uh, military and governments where we actually also uh, uh, provide them with with solutions. We have to definitely work on, on all those levels, OK? Just one question. Yeah? Uh, do you know if the open, how the OpenJDK compares to the Oracle JDK in terms of popularity? Uh, actually, that's, uh, that's a good question. I don't have stats, but I know that when uh, people running uh, Linux uh, typically use OpenJDK, of course. But we give the choice. We actually test IBM JDK, Oracle JDK, and Open JDK. So uh, I don't have exact number, but uh, definitely Open JDK is a very, very popular uh, implementation. Of course, I'm talking from a Red Hat perspective. Uh, uh, it'd be good to do. A, 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 I don't know if there are data around that, uh, but it'd be interesting to check. Yeah. Yeah. So, and in JBoss, well. What's our goal? Our goal is actually to deliver middleware to you guys, so you can, you know, run times. But we also provide uh, tooling. We also provide capabilities to manage your applications when you deploy them. So when I talk about management, we application performance monitoring, uh, logging metrics. Uh, we also have a, a bytecode instrumentation, so you can uh, AOP style. Uh, and tooling, we, have actually, we actually work very closely with Eclipse. We also uh, work with uh, Microsoft actually on Visual Code. Actually, we do the Java part of the Visual Code. So actually, there's a very strong collaboration uh, uh, recently, actually, since, uh, since we announced actually a collaboration with uh, Microsoft. We actually have teams working actively to make your life better. <laughs> actually, whether it's Java, .NET, I think there's a definitely investment in, that, in, in those directions. Uh, we just don't do runtime, we do integrations also. We have integration uh, um, uh, runtime, so around, um, we did the acquisition of FuSource, uh, if you remember. So Camel, Apache Camel is a project that we have. Uh, it's not all about Java, Apache Camel runs uh, uh, on, uh, on Kara runtime, OSGI runtime. 
so we have expertise not only on Java, but also SGI and Node.js. Okay, so it's, uh, it's definitely expertise we have internally and, and wherever workload you decide to go with, we have capa those capabilities. We also have mobile, mobile from the SDK to the push notification servers to also the mobile backend as a service. Again, we support, we, we have teams writing Swift, uh, Android, whatever you know, clients you want, even Firefox and all these, all these uh, open source uh, equivalents. Um, and finally, we also work very closely with Docker, and I'll, I'll mention that later. Uh, all our project, you can either download them as zip, but uh, they will be also available on, uh, on Docker, so you can do a git pull, and I'll mention that later also. So I mentioned, uh, you know, tooling capabilities, uh, multiple runtimes, so OSGI, Node.js, Java. Uh, we also offer uh, cloud services, so uh, everything we have that runs on, uh, on uh, all the projects we do, whether if, uh, even if it's security, uh, identity management, we have a project called Keycloak. Um, the app server, they run as well on bare metal, on virtualized environments, or on the cloud, whether you decide to, to do a, a deploy on Amazon, or on OpenShift, or on Azure, actually, and Google Cloud Engine. So we, we support that as well, through the OpenShift. OpenShift runs on Azure today, okay? Uh, and you don't have to worry about things like, um, um, I mean, one of the last questions we had in some of the recent meetings is, how do I do, for example, discovery? Oh, so we actually work and implement all these, uh, these integration with the different cloud providers, okay? So there is auto-discovery, et cetera, okay? Uh, okay, some of the projects that are very popular, uh, I mentioned uh, JBoss application server, so we, we had the seven iterations that we actually did a rename of JBoss recently. So even the rename, uh, we do it the open source way. So we did actually uh, uh, ask the community to come up with, uh, with a number of names, and uh, we chose about three, uh, the top three, and uh, ask also our legal team which one were the, you know, some, some names were definitely not, uh, not right, but uh, I think uh, we came up with Whitefly. So the reason why we did that is because we wanted to dissociate the, you know, the app server, because we have so many projects that every, when we say JBoss, everyone thinks it's an app server, okay? So, so we renamed it to Whitefly. So we have a number of other projects. Some people, I think a lot of you probably know Neti, yeah? Uh, Neti was Apache Mina before, so when we hired Trustin, actually we, we started Neti with him. Uh, now he's working at, at Line, he worked also for Twitter. Um, and the reason why, actually, uh, a lot of our engineers are very, uh, um, uh, very much sought after with some of the, the, play, the bigger players like Apple, Twitter, because we work on technology that work at scale. We actually invested a lot of effort in, in those projects with actually those uh, big players also. And actually it's a good thing when actually they, 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 they hire Trustin or Norman, we work together. We work on the same concerns. And as I mentioned before, the open source model is about solving common problem. We share the same problem. Uh, typically on the on Neti, that's exactly what what happens. So whether you know Apple invests in it, Twitter or Line or Red Hat, this goes in. This benefit everyone. Okay, so I think this is this is very important. Uh, under two also we and I'll talk a little bit more later about under two. That's another example. We we were satisfied with Tomcat, but we wanted more performance. So we started to. One of our team members actually working out of Australia, not in his garage, <laughs> but uh, uh, probably uh, in, his, uh, in his own bedroom, and, uh, and um, uh, came up over Christmas with Undertow. And actually, it's an extremely good project, which actually we actually replaced entirely the, in uh, JBoss. In Wildfly uh, 9, I think, we replaced Tomcat with Undertow. Okay. Actually, Tomcat, we use, uh, it's called, we use JBoss Web. So it was actually a fork of Tomcat and we, which is the same code base actually at uh, uh, Stomcat, we replace it with Undertow. Okay. I'll, <coughs> I'll spend a bit of time also on some of the other technology we contributed. So sometimes we find projects like, uh, as part of the spec, you have also to provide a Java SE, you know, uh, so, sorry, um, um, 
some of the security aspect of the uh, of Java E. We actually implemented it with Picketlink. Picketlink became quite popular, and we wanted also to provide something that could be used across all the runtimes. So what we tend to do is actually look at those capaci capabilities, extract them, and we made the picket link actually turn into a, a project called Kicklock, is actually a SSO identity manager service that support OAuth and uh, other protocol, okay? Like not only SAML2, but the new ones as well, okay? Um, so I think you'll see that we have the we follow very closely uh, the, the, of course, the trends, but also the, you know, we share the same problems. We, the community help us to be really in touch with what's happening, okay? So to the point, actually, Red Hat uses Kicklock now to do the, his own SSO uh, across all the, our infrastructure. Um, and Vertex, I mentioned, uh, I think someone, have you, are you using Vertex by any chance, no? I see you smiling, so. I you if I tell you. Okay. Uh, we, we, we ran one of our key products. We ran the first prototype internally in Vertex, which yeah. was about two times faster than our own implementation. Yeah. Our file, yeah. Okay. Well, Vertex is actually uh -huh. based uh, on top of Netty. Uh, it's, it's, it's very good. I don't know if you use uh, Vertex. So for, um, it's an event loop mechanism, so asynchronous. Um, uh, we can do, I think uh, we have uh, Clément Escoffier from Vertex coming soon. So it will have a talk on uh, uh, probably in June. So that'll be great uh, if we can actually assemble all the the, the people interested in, in that technology stack. Vertex are really as its third iteration. So it's even better today. Uh, so I think you'll be, uh, I'm sure you'll be happy to join that. So we'll keep you in touch, uh, <laughs> keep in touch with you for when that happened. Uh, the last one, this uh, funny icon there. Uh, <coughs> If someone knows, I have uh, I have something to give away. There, yeah. Who knows this one? You can do a Google search without the picture. Yeah. Okay, I give five seconds. No. It's uh, like a owl, something. Yeah. It's called a ocular. So we we also do it openly, you know, those icons. Um, actually, you can go on jboss.org slash design and you can download the icons. <laughs> but uh, um, Ocular helps you, same thing. We wanted to, uh, to give the ability to uh, an, uh, uh, do application performance monitoring, especially now with everything that runs on REST. Uh, people who are interesting to do business transaction monitoring. What happens when you, especially with uh, Vertex, for example, when you have a synchronous call, asynchronous call, how do you trace those business transactions? So that's what, uh, so we work with another, with open tracing actually, um, and also with Zipkin, uh, we support Zipkin, so and we actually bring all that goodness in there. So you can actually monitor these complex microservice environments, okay. Uh, distributed tracing, dis distributed testing and debugging is, is a complex subject. So that's an area where we invest. So I mentioned before, we not just deliver things on as a zip, but if you're, if you, who is using a Docker here? Oh, a lot of people, that's good. So you, it's a the Docker pull away. Um, so you, whether you're interested in uh, writing uh, e applications or reactive applications, you want to add performance monitoring or SSO identity management, or even if you do uh, in-memory data grid or distributed caching, you can do that. Okay, so just so we put everything on Docker, obviously, and that's uh, that's the best way probably for you to consume very quickly. Um, we have obviously on GitHub we have all the quick starts, everything to get up, get you up and running for every single project we have. Okay, so that's uh, and lots of videos <laughs> and conferences. <laughs> Uh, so 10 years of Jabo, so what happened during these 10 years? Um, I want to do the mapping with what happened with, uh, with Java E, the enterprise Java world, because uh, a lot of what we do has been driven, and especially on the, the JBoss application server side, has been driven by, by uh, uh, the enterprise Java specification, because we are uh, compliant to it, uh, and we also uh, have to follow 
basically the, the, the spec and to certify. But at the same time, we also have, a, we have a, actually a, a reacted and also be proactive also to some of the trends, and I'll touch on that. Uh, first, when we started with, uh, in 1999, we started with a, a, a JBoss that was you know, based on JMX. I think everyone knows about JMX, very, very easy to configure. You also have all the tools and the instrumentation available to, to control your app server. So that, that was one of the good things. It was still small, very easy to use. People, it was popular because people, instead of having a, a one gigabyte download, they could actually go online and unzip, uh, download and unzip without without paying anything. So that's how it got popular. Uh, then we started to, uh, to move to JBoss AS5 and 6. And um, we changed, actually, the JMX microkernel. To we, we, we wanted to have modularity. We wanted to, to give people the options already to start to assemble the app server they want. You know? um, and we did that with Pojo Micro Container. That took a little bit of time. The reason why, at the same time, we um, someone was asking me, oh, JBoss AS5, and I was a customer actually still, I was, I was not an employee yet. Uh, JBoss AS5 took a long time to come, and uh, one of the reasons for that, it was also at the same time at, as the acquisition. And that's where actually Red Hat, we actually had what we call the productization process. We had to actually, that's why today we can <coughs> reproduce any builds. We can give customer API <coughs> or developers, anyone who use Wi-Fi or, or EAP, actually. It's what we call a productized version of the upstream code. That's where we bring the API stability, the 50 plus or 100 plus certifications. So people actually, when they take a release family of, let's say, EAP 6, when they do a 6.4, they're not going to, no regression will be introduced. Okay? So we have a really stacked taxonomy of major, minor, and uh, CP, commutative patch, that allow us, for example, to fix a hard bleed problem. You don't want your uh, entire infrastructure to, to go down because you fix something, okay? So I think these, these took time. And all the knowledge and the expertise that we had read that, we actually, actually brought it across to JBoss and make sure JBoss pro projects actually could be hardened, stable, as the the the, mission, the target, um, as you say, target users of Red Hat was. For example, we we on the stock exchange, we are on military, uh, government, uh, transport, all industry vertical use JBoss today as they were using Rails. So we had to be uh, mission critical ready. Okay, so so that's what that's what happened here. That transformation. We were not anymore in the you know the the cool kids you know delivering like quick uh, fast. So we still do that. We still have a very fast iteration process, but that kind of slowed down here. But now we actually accelerated. We renamed JBoss AS7. That's where I started to, to, uh, to work for JBoss. Now we started also to, to, uh, to follow on being lockstep with the, the spec, but also contribute to them. So we did a lot of contribution here. We also uh, well, renamed it to Wi-Fly. <laughs> We also brought a lot of improvements, like Undertow. Undertow actually is, as I mentioned before, is the, the JBoss web, uh, web replacement, the Tomcat replacement. Uh, we wanted also, in 2010, we realized that we wanted to have higher density in the data center. So the operation people, people running, you know, like the Red Marts, you know, you, memory cost, you know, it, Cost, cost money, you know, the more, uh, the current uh, options you had if you were running a Java E application and we wanted to scale out and to bring more and more servers, you, you're going to have to spin more and more and more and that costs you, if you have un, uh, maybe 10 instances, that's okay. If you run uh, maybe 200, 200 meg for each of them, at, just at, without your app to start. But when you have a thousand core or a thousand uh, application running, uh, that starts to, to, you know, to matter. So what we did is actually um, with uh, AS7, we actually totally reviewed and went back on the drawing board and made sure already that we were ready for the next generations of you know, high density cloud environments where we could actually, and even we had OpenShift starting. So for us, it was, it was already a, a problem that we had to solve. We couldn't. Obviously, we couldn't put IBM or WebLogic there. <laughs> it was already uh, quite significant to run. You know, could we give already to developers on OpenShift 
a cartridge where they can run a Java E application. It would have cost us a fortune. Okay, so that by design we were forced to actually went, go back to the drawing board and and really think how we're going to actually serve those kind of requirements. So with AS7 we reduce by ten uh, tenfold the footprint of our app server. So to the and I think I have a, a slide later on, but uh, we we did a great job at that. The thread consumption, the bootstrap, the, the bootstrap, the bootstrap. The startup time, sorry, excuse me. Um, we did actually some competition to do a sub one second startup of all E6 uh, services. And I think a Japanese, uh, uh, one of the Japanese jug, uh, someone started in 800 milliseconds, all the Java E6 services. Uh, so that's, that's, that was the driver behind it, okay, to allow for high density. We also did lots of changes. We wanted uh, better management, the ability to to, uh, to patch things very quickly in those environments. And so all that work has been moving towards cloud native applications to support that, to also uh, he allow for cloud readiness uh, and scalability. We introduced, uh, uh, just checking the time, so okay. Um, modularity, I mentioned uh, uh, the uh, the spec for, uh, for Java uh, to support modularity was supposed to be earlier, and uh, I think it, it will happen only with Java 9 today, with the Jigsaw project. Uh, so waiting for that, we actually started to bring those into AS7 with uh, JBoss modules. Okay, so that was already, so in 2010, we were already at the vision to, to be where like uh, Drop Wizard, uh, Spring Booties, and Wildfly Swarm, and now Macro Profile. We had that vision initially to actually start it to, to reduce really the core. We actually reduced the core to capabilities that are revolving around uh, uh, control security. So we have the same control plane, same security, uh, same uh, privileges, etc., to control and bring up and down services. Okay. Uh, so that's the work we've done here, and we kept, kept, kept bringing it. We also um, introduced uh, uh, other changes around, uh, like, I don't know if you use uh, uh, messaging, uh, so Apache, uh, ActiveMQ, and uh, um, work with us to actually bring Ornate Q together, so this is the Artemis project, so we bring that also a, a very high performance uh, uh, GMS implementations. Uh, and of course, uh, some other uh, with uh, with the latest uh, uh, JDK uh, J, uh, um, server side JavaScript capabilities uh, that we introduce also with Undertow. So you can run Java JavaScript on the server now with uh, with uh, Wildfly through Undertow. Okay. Um, so that was for the app server. Now, when I talk about uh, uh, um, cloud, uh, smaller, uh, different type of architecture, like microservices architecture. Our answer has been um, uh, Wildfly Swarm. Okay, so I'll touch a little bit on that later. Um, and uh, we actually certify, I mean certify, we actually micro profile 1.0. The micro profile 1.0 is actually JAXI, CDI, and JSONP. Okay. Um, so, I mentioned the, the improvements that we did very much focus on performance. That's an example uh, when we started in 2000. That was actually uh, um, Great Indian Developer Summit in India. I don't know if you've been there. Uh, we, go, we, we usually attend uh, Great Indian Developer Summit every year. Uh, one of the reasons, actually, Bangalore is the number one city in the world to use our technology. And actually, uh, six of the 10 top cities are in India. So that is uh, that's fantastic. So this is actually a two cluster of four Pis, Raspberry Pi, first generation, 256 megabytes, running an application that was using uh, a GMS and uh, stateful EGB. Okay, so that was running on batteries and with Wi-Fi, and we were actually asking the application was running; it was uh, uh, shared with the public, and we were asking in people to unplug dismantle the things and the application was still running. I was accessing it through my laptop. So shows actually that we had the, we actually finally achieved our goal to 
really condense to, to 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 increase the you know the the density you know per core. And I think uh, it's a one core machine, uh, the the Raspberry Pi, the <coughs> ARM uh, ARM chip. So. Uh, less than, I think, 800 megahertz, uh, 256 megabyte of RAM. So it was really, really low spec. <laughs> okay. So I mentioned Undertow. Some people maybe, uh, who, who heard of Undertow here? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, quite a lot of people, actually. That's good. Actually, uh, Undertow has been used, actually, uh, quite a lot. Even with Spring Boot, that's an option. You can choose between Tomcat and, and uh, Undertow. And one of the main reasons why we chose Undertow, why actually uh, Stuart Douglas, who actually is the, the project lead for Undertow, wrote Undertow, is uh, uh, for performance. I think we, the more we actually started to, to, to go through the performance, you know, the, the, the stress on the app server, we will quickly see where the, the pain points are. So one of them, actually, the, the bottleneck uh, was uh, Tomcat. Uh, so there are other bottlenecks, obviously, but the, the more we see, the, we were replacing those bits, so we could actually have no uh, uh, less and less um, uh, uh, bottleneck, in the, in the, especially in the, around the HTTP traffic. Uh, so it's, uh, I think, uh, I can't remember how old is that project, probably uh, three, four years now, yeah, when it started. But we could do actually, we could saturate network card. So one million transactions per second, so zero byte type, of course, but uh, that's definitely the goal. Uh, it's used now in the Wildfly application server, and also we give it to customers now. We, we have the concept of back time. So in the open source uh, world, we, when we elect something, a project that's, su that's sufficiently robust, we, we, we have that period we call back time. So we, the, the good thing with open source, you have that notion of feedback, which is very important. And, we have, and then the project lead you know, assess that feedback and is the, the only one that will say, okay, this is ready. So it's our QE. The QE is the entire world. <laughs> we have thousands and actually millions of downloads. The community is not just people who write, it's people who download, give us feedback. So I think that is very important. Um, so that's why we actually promoted it to be used within uh, our, our product. So because of this stability, this performance, and the maturity and the back time. We, so uh, there's a lot of goodness. Of course, uh, HTTP, HTTP2, uh, HTTP upgrade with support multiplexi multiplexing. So you can, you can do multiple uh, uh, protocol through the same, uh, same, uh, same entry point. Um, uh, you can actually do blocking and non-blocking use case. Some application actually do blocking. I mean, Red Mart certainly. <laughs> I don't know if you use Undertow for that, but definitely. You can also have, a, of course, Servet 3.1 container support, uh, load balancing and reverse proxy, including with HTTP2 and HTTP2S. Okay? So that's, uh, and a lot more. So of course, uh, um, uh, there's extension to, so LPN is an extension to TLS, so that requires HTTP2 over SSL. And we do open SSL support for much higher performance gains uh, for encrypted communications. Just a question. Yeah? Uh, how do we get the Undertow team of developers? How many people? Um, I think uh, the, the way we work, we, we have one project lead, and <coughs> typically, um, we share the load across, uh, I think there's probably 40 people or something working uh, purely on upstream uh, Wi-Fi. You, you can see actually on the, <coughs> on the Wi-Fi website all the contributors, some of them from Red Hat, some are not from Red Hat. So to give you really an exact size, you really have to go online. So some project have, uh, I don't know exactly for Undertow, but you just go on the Undertow page. Sometimes the team can be two or three people. Um, Sometimes can be hundreds, uh, depends on the project. So, um, and the team actually is is a uh, uh, there's the upstream development. There's also the people who actually are part of the QE side, QE part. So they write test development. There's test development part. There's the there's the productization part. Means how do I make how do I make on the tour run within this container and these containers on this operating system, on those uh, architectures. So I think uh, the team is actually, uh, is not just one, one or two person, or 10 or 20, is actually uh, much larger. 
that includes community and also internal people at Red Hat. Yeah, there's a whole chain. So when we have a project like on the tour, it's actually the, the, the time it's actually you do a pull request or you do a, a build and the time it's, it's out, there's actually a lot of uh, process involved. So we do, uh, uh, we do have a, a, a CI CD infrastructure. Uh, you can see it online actually. You can, uh, you can go and participate. I think there's, a, there's actually a, um, well, everything that's on Wi-Fi is actually public. So you can see the, the builds running. You can start them yourself, I believe. Yeah. And um, we also use CloudBees. We use our own infrastructure. So we work actually with a lot of people. It depends if we are own the project or not. So, but I think that's usually how it works. So what we, we introduce also, we introduce a lot of other things. Like, for example, I mentioned Heartbleed or other things. So we know that we have a, there is something called victim database. So there is a, all the signatures of um, uh, static, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, so it's all the all the all the vulnerability signatures. All the so you can do also um, uh, vulnerability detections. You can do uh, you can so we have a Maven plugin for that, for example. So when you do a pull request. That generates a build and gets. So you probably see that in a CI/CD uh, uh, talk. You know, it's a similar principle. So we have a continuous integration, continuous development. So that is totally automated. And uh, the more we, we we find bugs and tests, we bring the test upstream. Obviously, yeah. So we we have different checkpoints, different exit criteria across those when we promote one build to the other phase. Okay. And to the point where we bring all that goodness, actually, and I don't know if you saw the. <coughs> The, the, the Red Hat Summit, we're actually going to give all that to you now. So you be able to create a project. We already started to do that with a starter, whether it's a Spring Boot, whether it's a Vertex project. It'll be in your cloud environment. You'll uh, be able to edit it with Eclipse J, for example. Or you can edit it on your end editor by doing a, a, a Git clone and then merge your, uh, pu uh, push your changes later. Then that can also trigger different uh, CI CD pipelines. Okay, so you can take your jobs, start uh, do your work, commit it, it'll trigger, and then it'll be promoted or built. Okay, so I think that's all. That chain is gonna be uh, really our focus today. Okay, so that productivity. So that's the that's the focus we are bring all those first class projects into this environment. Okay. Um, Okay, so I mentioned Wildfly Swarm when we started in 2010 uh, to start to do modularity. Lots of people use actually only one or two parts, you know. More and more now it's really REST, persistence, messaging, maybe transactions, and other things. We use uh, REST, uh, uh, more than REST, so more than REST, and JPA. Yeah, what what API do you use typically? You use um, REST, you use uh, persistent JPA, and what else do you use? Do you use messaging also? Yeah, we're not using uh, JPA. No. So what do you use for persistence? Uh, depending on the application, but sometimes we use Morphia and Mongo directly. Okay. Some other systems are using Postgres, but I'm not sure. What through Hibernate or through what? I don't know. Yeah. They're using it's okay. Just Okay, but the, I mean, the, uh, maybe I rephrase my question. So typically, you you expose a REST endpoint and you persist. You know, the the use cases are you know less and less beyond that. You know, sometimes of course there's a there's some logic. Maybe you have some uh, business rules or rules engines. You know, that that process some of the you know give you know make some decisions based on the data or the the, the that you receive. But uh, typically, you. You use very little, so that's why we are. And when we started Wildfly Swarm, um, that was the, the the notion. Okay, so that was the driver behind it. Okay, so and also to create an execu executable jar, similarly to what Spring Boot and Drop Wizard does. Okay, because our stuff was embeddable, but through Archelian, we did actually um, uh, those tests using Ar Archelian that created uh, those jar, or and you could test them like JUnit. Um, so I think that's what Archean was created for. But uh, that's how we started it. Now the 
the, the direction we've been taking actually have also influenced also the, the micro profile implementation. So we've been working with, uh, with IBM and uh, uh, Tommy, Tommy Tribe to, to actually evolve that, that to, a to, a, to a group, a collaborative group and potentially a specification and a standard. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> I keep talking so maybe uh, uh, <coughs> a little bit of water, but uh, do you have any questions so far? Uh, so, I have a question actually. I mean, what does this microprofile is about? So, that is the, the next step, as I mentioned here, in just reading the slide, in enterprise Java evolution. So, uh, and that's something uh, like, uh, I mean, lots of people are, have a stab at it, you know, because as I mentioned before, we don't need the whole, the, the whole, sp the whole specs. You know, that's why I was asking, what do you use exactly? And, and we realized actually that the profile of those that we, that we deploy are very, very small. You know, they, they have very, very limited number of APIs. They also, so you don't need the whole, the whole server. You, know? you just need a, a, a set of functionality of capabilities. So how do we address that? And I think that what drove the, the discussion around the, um, under the creation of MicroProfile. And, uh, but it, we didn't, the, the people who started to talk and it's through uh, open collaboration and with actually a number of players we are listed um, here. So the people at Payara, which is Glassfish, uh, I think, yes, uh, no, Payara is, uh, so you have a blank. <laughs> uh, Red Hat, Wildfly Swarm, uh, the London user group, um, AMOC, which is a project also very similar that implement the, the, the micro profile, IBM, and Toby Tribe. So we, we actually sat down together, and I think Mark Little announced that last year um, during the Red Hat Summit. So you'll see uh, um, uh, more details there, okay? So, but typically is, um, um <coughs> It's our answers, no, our answer, those people's answers to how to bring actually enterprise Java in those environments like cloud native uh, type applications, hybrid cloud, uh, lower density, smaller set of APIs. And actually the, the first set of APIs that have been delivered in the release 1.0 is jack size for REST. CDI and JSON, okay, JSON P, and that was in September 2016. So that's already there. Um, we already with Wi-Fi Swarm, we already uh, support that. Uh, so that's uh, that's something that that follows the similar principle to open source, which are a great vector to bring standardization. Okay, so. No point creating a standard and then go implementation. So open source is a great way to validate. Like when we do, we call it back time for our runtime. Uh, this is a very similar principle, okay? To build consensus and to s standardize, okay? So I think this is a, when it's done in an open collaborative manner, it's much, much more efficient. Just one question on that. Yep. Do you think there is a risk that because, like for example, what we saw with J JPA, have a specification and several implementations, then it's harder to evolve, right? Because you have to wait for the application servers to implement the next version of the specification. So is it going to be the case for microprofile as well? Like, is it going to be frozen for like two years? No, no, I think that's the, we, that's the problem we want to address, actually. Uh, that's why we didn't, I think the, there's no intent to do standardize now, okay? Yeah to allow that velocity, you know, that release cadence where we capture as much feedback as possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there will uh, be only one implementation for now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I, there is a roadmap actually. Uh, we, um, I don't have the details here, but there is definitely a, a roadmap with different releases in the next year and two. Uh, and what people want is people to contribute, collaborate. You can actually go uh, directly on the microprofile.io, so it's, it's a formative thing, obviously. So that's, that's started now, and you can actually join some of the, 
the MicroProfile forums today. You can see the discussion live actually between our teams, IBM, um, uh, the London groups, the, the Brazilian groups as well, and, uh, um, and AMOC as well. Um, and you can already run examples. So this is already running, okay? So you already have run uh, uh, implementation available, okay? So that's, the idea is, not, is to be vendor neutral, and that's the, the key thing, okay? So that's, that will prevent what you just have, what you just say. And actually we, we, we actually, it's, a, it's actually an Eclipse Foundation project. And that is also another important step uh, because it's based on meritocracy, <laughs> excuse my English, and ensure vendor neutrality, okay? So that's very important. And that means that meritocracy also drive, you know, the ability to change leadership over time, you know? Uh, based on your investments, your commitment, okay? Uh, it's also a great legal and technical infrastructure for, for such project to live, and it accepts actually a, a Apache license, okay? So it's very friendly, okay? So to remove actually all the blockages that you just said before, yeah? So that's the right environment, and I think this, this has been done also collaboratively, and that those discussions happen with those members, okay? So to encourage that exactly, okay? Okay, Ooh, that's, uh, that's me for now. <laughs>